my name is um, Jelle van Dijk, as um, was already mentioned. I am working in uh, Twente, which is in the Netherlands, one of the three technical universities in the Netherlands, uh, the most least known of the three. You may know Delft and Eindhoven. This is the third one, Twente, it's more in the countryside. Uh, nice and quiet, lots of trees. Um, and I want to thank the people here on the slide because they've all been co cooperating in the, what I'll be presenting today. So, um, yeah, so my, my background is not in autism research uh, from the start. I sort of came into this field from the side, if you wish, because what we do in our research group is we do participatory design and design research. So we use design as a way of doing research. I'm going to say something about that. Um, and at some point, I um, became interested in uh, designing assistive technologies and products and services for people with uh, impairments. And I'm no longer, this is the only time I'm going to use the word, uh, because, of course, having becoming more and more engaged with the community, I'm, uh, uh, I've also started to change my language and my way of framing what it is actually that um, the autistic community is going for and what they want and what they need. And actually that's becoming more and more the whole theme of my research to find out how we should in some sense reframe the question of what it is that we're trying to do instead of just designing the new technological gadget. So before I go into that in more detail, I want to start with a picture. Um, and this is a picture from a, a very famous Dutch children's book. It's called Pluck van de Petteflet. The, the little boy on the left with the hat is Pluck. He's the main character. But at some point, he enters into an apartment downstairs in the flat where he lives. And in that apartment, there are six or even seven little boys living with their father. Uh, but they are so uh, hyperactive, so to speak. I think nowadays they would definitely get the diagnosis of ADHD, right? So um, hyper hyperactivity disorder. Um, so what the father did, instead of trying to keep them calm all the time, because it wasn't working anyway, was he just put mattresses on the floors and the walls and the sides everywhere. So the whole flat was full of mattresses. So the kids could jump and, 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 and play and run and whatever, and the lady downstairs uh, wouldn't be bothered. Now this lady downstairs was a, like a, a, a witch kind of character, the bad character in the book. And um, uh, so at some point, they have to drink tea at her place. So, um, I mean, there are occasions, there are situations in your life where you have to act um, sort of in the neurotypical way, in the normative way, and respond to all kinds of cus customs. But my, one of my um, um, take-home messages, if you wish, of my talk will be that this is not what we should design for. So the technology should not be designed to make people behave like this. Uh, actually, the technologies that I want to design would be more like the, the mattresses, right? So to, to enable people to be themselves, while at the same time also being able to deal with the challenges of everyday life, and uh, um, uh, because there are things, you, you need food and, and, and friends and social and so on. So you need things, but uh, you can do it in different ways. So that's the, that's the main point, really. And I have a few uh, further disclaimers. So um, I'm, I'm not going to, like Mark, Mark is a real scientist. He has all kinds of statistics and so on. I'm not going to present any hard evidence of anything today. I'm just going to present you with ideas and concepts and designs that we made. We did have a lot of actual interaction with uh, people on the autistic spectrum, young autistic adults, their caregivers, uh, healthcare organizations. We had all kinds of conversations, and I could have maybe put that into big tables and, and, and statistics, but I'm not just not going to do it because I don't have time for that. Um, so, uh, because we want to design things, right? So that's what we do. Um, but the title, Design Your Life, is actually also quite misleading because, of course, you cannot design your life. You should live your life. Uh, however, maybe at the end of the talk, we can reflect on that a little bit more, like what, what would it mean to be designing your life? And finally, uh, uh, very often people ask me, can I already buy this thing? No, uh, nothing of what I will present today can be bought in the store because it's all conceptual stuff. There's prototypes, but for instance, one of the main things that I'm working with is one prototype that is always broken, 
un unless there is a student uh, fixing it again. Um, so, so that's sort of the status of the stuff that I work with at this moment. And the final disclaimer, I'm not even a real designer. Um, so, okay. So now I've said everything that, uh, that's um, um, all the disclaimers. Uh, let's start. So I have, um, uh, there was at some point I was at a conference and there was this thing. Um, it was a Google Glass and uh, looking through the Google Glass, it would recognize emotions and then in the upper right corner of your visual field, you would see uh, what emotion you would be looking at. And many people were very enthusiastic about this thing and I was actually quite critical about it. Um, although today, uh, at some point, uh, somebody said that it might be interesting actually. Um, uh, but uh, we can talk about that. But um, uh, it, it all matters what is the purpose of this device, right? So I made a little list uh, at another conference tweeting that saying if you encounter a technology, uh, maybe the first thing to do is ask some basic questions for yourself and try to answer them like who designed this thing? So who's behind this project, right? Is it autistic people behind the project? Or is it a big technological corporation behind the project? Or is it for instance um, a psychologist um, who is uh, really just using the technology to measure things, right? Uh, and then sort of selling it as a product to use. It can be both things, right? There, there can be win-win situations, but it's very important to at least know where the product sort of comes from conceptually. Um, other questions are, what problem does it, this product really solve? And Whose problem is that, right? So many assistive technologies that I see are actually not solving the problem of the person um, uh, with the disability or the impairment or whatever the condition you want to call it, but they are solving problems of people around that person. So um, many of you might be parents, a lot of assistive technologies are actually also for you, right? because you have a hard time uh, doing all the daily stuff with an autistic kid, right? That's just hard work, I fully acknowledge that, but it's good to be aware of who is actually, who's the technology actually for? Who is benefiting mostly from this technology? And as long as we're clear about that, it's fine, right? A anybody can be a user of technology, but sometimes the product is sold in a different way. So it's good to, uh, as a designer, I'm always asking those kinds of questions, right? Not, does it work technically, or uh, uh, does it have so many megabytes in it, or whatever. I'm uh, answering these more content-like questions. Right? I'm, I'm a bit critical about whether this product is good for anybody, except maybe for um, uh, computer engineers who are interested in recognizing faces. <laughs> right? So that it's a very challenging task to be able to get this to work huh, as an engineer. So uh, the second thing is there's a lot of technology coming at you, and uh, so I also see it as, as, as a task for us as design researchers to um, help certain groups in society who are not very tech savvy to prepare themselves for the world that's going to come, right? So all of this stuff, um, we've been talking about VR. In the early in the morning, we've been talking about apps and tablets and so on. We all know about that, right? Ten years ago, it wasn't there, but now we're used to it, right? But um, uh, what's coming next, apart from the VR, is all kinds of things that will be in your house. So Internet of Things, objects, uh, everything connected uh, through the Internet, and all of this stuff is talking, uh, exchanging information, uh, getting stuff from the Internet, and so on. Now the question is, um, what do you want to do with it? It's perfectly possible to use that kind of new technology to your advantage, but if, you don't, if you're not prepared and if you're not participating in the process of designing these things, then uh, the tech people will do it for you, and they will have very different ideas about what you really want. Huh? And then you just get it, and then you ha sort of have to deal with it. It will be the new reality for you, right? So I'm inviting you all to become engaged in designing these kinds of products uh, in whatever way you can, or at least shouting your opinion about them as much as possible. So these are all terms that are now um, in the research departments and gradually um, slipping into um, our everyday lives. And um, what I'm mostly interested in, um, in my kind of research, is actually not so much about bringing a person into the digital world, like either people in their iPads or 
with the goggles in the VR and bringing them into the digital world. Uh, I'm actually interested in another mo uh, development, which is about bringing digital interactivity into the physical world again. Right? So you could imagine that all these chairs have a uh, sensor and uh, the lighting is responding directly to uh, whether people are sitting here or yes or no. Or, uh, well, everything can become interactive or smart, so to speak. And that's a, that's a big new design field where all kinds of op opportunities are arising, but we really don't know yet how to design for it in the right way. Good, so what I do is research through design, which means I'm not just designing products for the purpose of creating a product. Actually, as I said, none of my stuff is on the market and it probably will never be there because I'm, in that sense, really an academic. I'm in the university. I'm interested in if we design these products together with all the different stakeholders and in, in, real, in, 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 in interaction with real practices of people, what do we learn about those practices and what do we learn about what role technology could play in those practices? Right? So all my examples that I will give are sort of, um, for me, they are research tools. Right? On the other hand, they could actually become projects, right? and that, uh, uh, products, that's possible, but uh, that's not what I uh, do. I'm not, I'm not an um, uh, entrepreneur at all. I, no I don't know anything about money and so on. Uh, and you need to have that. Okay. Um, so. What is this research through design and how do I use design? Well, there's a few uh, characteristics of what design can bring that, for instance, may not necessarily always be present in the way scientific research, like psychology or educational research, is, is sometimes not uh, touching on that. And uh, the practice itself, your, your own everyday life, is also maybe not always uh, touching on that. So one of the things is, um, not just trying to answer questions or solve problems right away, but engaging in a process by which you become clear on what actually the question is, or what actually the problem is. Right? So this is assuming that when you encounter a problem in everyday life, most probably that's not the real problem. In order to really solve it, you have to sort of dig under it and find out what's the real problem. Right? So that's one thing that design can help you with. The process of design is all about that. Uh, the other thing was sort of the same thing, is reframing implicit assumptions and ways of looking. So as you think that the problem is this or that, that's because you're looking at the situation in a certain way. You're looking at it from a certain frame of reference. Right? So part of the task of a designer is to step back from that and break away the frames that you have and try to look at it from a different perspective, from a different frame. And there's all kinds of techniques for doing that. Um, one thing that we find very important, not all designers, but our department at least, in a human-centered design is to empower users of technology to have a voice in this process. Uh, we're also very much focused on uh, what I call learning by doing. So this is not about first doing a year-long literature survey on the characteristics of autism and then designing an app but it would be about very quickly trying to build something, make something, do something, and then reflect on it with everybody involved and say, hey, what do we have here? Is that any good? Uh, what does it teach us and how can we make it better? Right? So it's a very hands-on approach. It's also about bringing perspectives together. So um, you could be a parent, you could be a, a caregiver, professional, it could be some, somebody else um, um, uh, that is very much involved with a person, and you could be a person on the autistic spectrum. And all these people together have, uh, all have their own views on the situation and what the problem is and how technology could help that. It's about making things tangible and concrete. So if you have all these different perspectives, right? Suppose you're trying, suppose you're a parent and you're trying to understand your kid, or the kid is trying to, to um, sort of fit in with what you want or with the situation but, but has trouble of doing that, then having a tangible concrete object sort of in between you could help you uh, connect to each other, right? Uh, because talking in the abstract about things is much more difficult. And of course design is not about necessarily about what, n what is now the case, right? Researchers uh, scientists, they want to find out what is the case, right? Whereas designers are always interested in the question, what can be 
the case, what, what could be the case, yeah, right? So it's, it, it involves in part finding out what, what's happening right now, but it's always directed at what can we change? How can we transform? Okay, good, I'm, I shall go a little bit further. So we have all these techniques called co-design techniques or participatory design techniques. And uh, the only thing I want to say about this slide is that uh, the website that's associated is, is unfortunately in Dutch. <laughs> and the other <laughs> only thing I want to say, so I'm sorry for that. The other thing I want to say about that is uh, that basically it all comes down to creating tangible objects and activities that help you through a creative process together. So it's, it's, it are all materials that help you to step away from your usual ideas, step away from your common assumptions, um, uh, share ideas between uh, each other and so on, and you need some materials for doing that. And then depending on the, the user group that you uh, work with, we always design new stuff for that. So we design the co-design tools as well. But there are some methods that are sort of being standardized and that, that you could use and, uh, and so on, but we often just make new stuff because if we work with new people, we, we think, well, for instance, we work with people and the, and, the, and the whole exercise is about going to uh, the public swimming pool, then we want to do co-design in the swimming pool, of course. We don't want to do it in, a, in an office, right? So, so and we're going to invent completely different activities that fit that, uh, that project. So the basic cycle of what we do is that we go around this cycle and there's different activities. There's not necessarily one starting point. There's um, um, talking with users, and we call them users, so the, use, the potential new users of the technology that we're going to invent, right? Um, and other stakeholders. Um, working with prototypes, quickly prototyping and, and, and uh, having people test that out and then reflect on it. Uh, but also just observing what people actually do in their everyday life. Uh, and of course, a process of designing, generating ideas, uh, selecting from those ideas, and then uh, creating a, a prototype out of it. And we, we, the whole idea is to do that in a, in a couple of cycles, because the problem is so complex that you cannot solve it in one go. So you have to make one first rough sketch of the whole cycle, and then do it again, and then do it again. Okay, so the topic today uh, that I want, want to show some examples from is about young autistic adults. Um, I'm quite a fan of uh, Schoss. Schoss is uh, a Dutch a young autistic adult who is very active on Twitter. She has a very big uh, fan base on Twitter. And she recently moved to, for the first time, she uh, went uh, living alone in uh, her new apartment. And uh, all the Twitter uh, fans have been uh, following her, how she was buying stuff for in the apartment, going painting, um, um, uh, cooking a meal for the first time, and so on. So I asked her if I could um, uh, put this tweet on, and she, uh, she happily agreed. Um, so in the, these are three tweets, and you should read them from the bottom to the top. So the, the, the first one is, do I have followers in this city that I am now? Because tomorrow I have to work, and in the evening I will give a talk in, uh, in the same city. So is there somebody I could drop by in for dinner? Uh, or shall I go to the Mac once more? <laughs> so, of course, uh, 100 people said, you can have dinner at my place, and so on. So she's very uh, <laughs> handy in that way. There was one other time where she said, I'm now in this gas station here and there, and I, I forgot my wallet. And then immediately somebody else said, uh, and then it says, oh, thank you, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> she got, yeah. um, but then the second one is, um, uh, oh, and then the second one was, uh, oh, to be sure, um, I'd be happy to cook my own meals. This was just my attempt at be, being social. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, but then uh, not much later, she uh, said, uh, I was sleeping and I had to puke, and then I really pity myself for having to change my own bed. Right. So, so, there's, so there's really big up and downs, um, um, and also a very strong urge to be independent, of course, like everyone else, right? We all want that. So there's a wealth of problems, but they are often misrepresented, uh, in my opinion. So, so we don't really understand yet what the real problems are, but we very quickly have an idea about, oh, this is the problem, uh, looking at it from the outside. Um, I think there's a gold mine of talent. Uh, we've seen it today as well from other people presenting here. Um, uh, uh, very, I'm very impressed uh, with all of that uh, and opportunities, but very often they go unseen. 
Uh, and there's people growing and developing and making the transformation into independence uh, with all the hurdles uh, on the way. Um, and at the same time, in the context, we have a healthcare system, at least in the Netherlands, that's in transition, where there's less money and there's more focus on uh, independence, but sometimes from a negative reason, right? Independence means we're not going to pay for stuff anymore. You have to do it yourself. Um, but also there is a positive, uh, a really positive, genuine uh, idea of uh, can we organize healthcare in such a way that people are at most as possible have their own self-control and, and they are in the director's seat of their own healthcare. Um, and uh, what I see happening is that autistic people are increasingly uh, sort of gaining a voice and speaking up and saying, I want a seat at the table. And uh, it's not just researchers and designers and engineers deciding all of it. Uh, I, I want to have a say in it. So within that context, we did a number of projects. And I want to say something about that. And the basic question that I asked was a kind of a philosophical question. Uh, how can we design technologies that enable people to sort of um, build on or and sustain their own life world, right? Everybody sort of creates an environment around themselves which is, uh, um, consists of all kinds of things. Um, and this life world is not just your environment, it helps you, right? It's your sphere, that is your, your uh, huh? well, um, what is this life world? Well, this is the life world of Max, uh, it's not his real name, um, and, and it's an apartment and um, uh, there's all kinds of stuff there, right? Uh, uh, there's one of my students sitting there, but you can't, can barely see her. Uh, <laughs> um, so what, what does the live world contain? Well, you have your own skills, and then together with those still skills, you have certain routines, ways of doing things. You have tools, objects, and you have your stuff, right? Your stuff in your living environment around. That's the, sort of the physical, the material level of things. Then you have, of course, a social context, right? So every day somebody comes here in the room of Max to talk about how was your day for half an hour. And for instance, Max has all kinds of clocks in his house and he deliberately puts them in all kinds of different orientations. And the healthcare worker said he does that on purpose so that I talk with him longer than half an hour because I only have one half an hour. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's true, that's her story. So there's a whole social context of people having ideas and visions on, on what's happening there with role division and responsibilities. And then there is a, a process in time, right? So people learn things, develop, things happen, they have to respond to it. Um, you grow up, uh, you go from uh, elementary school and, uh, and living with your parents, you go to independent living or not, and then, so that's the process over time, right? How can we design something that fits in there, that helps you do this, all of this, in a way that strengthens instead of makes things more difficult all the time. So I will give three examples. Um, some are more closely related um, to, to this living in environment and other a bit less. But I've, I've, I've chosen to, to put them in the orders of close to the body and in your immediate domestic environment, so at home and then outside. So first, close to the body, we have uh, designed a concept of a, uh, a smartwatch application. Um, so we didn't design the watch, that's a commercial thing. Uh, and we didn't design the phone as such, but the, the interface. And uh, what this thing does is that it measures your heart rate. It has a baseline of your baseline heart rate. And then when it deviates too far from your own baseline, so it needs a bit of calibrating in the beginning, then uh, it changes the color of the, what you see on the screen. And then um, when, when you go too far out of the baseline, uh, it goes all, uh, all the way to the edge of the screen. And then it calls you on your phone, assuming that you're in a situation of uh, stress or uh, uh, high tension. It calls you on your own phone, and then you hear a, um, a soothing message or a calming message that you have put there yourself. Uh, so you put um, a message for yourself at the ready, and when the uh, when you need that moment, it will it it will call you. And the sort of the funny gimmick of it was that it, in social situations, it gives you an excuse to walk away, right? So you're very tense, and then you can say, "I have to take this," <laughs> and then you you sort of hear. So so I I don't know if this really works in this version, right? But it's it's saying something about how can technology help you 
and, and a whole discussion from this comes, if I talk to other people about this, and especially uh, technologists, um, they want to know how do you know, how do you accurately measure stress, right? From the heart rate, can't be done, it's too difficult. You need machine learning, you need all these, you need artificial intelligence and so on. I'm not really interested if it really measures stress. Um, uh, the point of this thing is that you make sense of it after a while, right? Of course, there is some catch, right? Because if, if it only confuses you, uh, then it doesn't work, right? So it, it should measure something, and, and we're also working with these technologies, and of course I also want to measure stress the, the right way. Um, that's an interesting challenge in its own right. But the interesting um, sort of philosophical debate that I have with people about this is what is this product actually trying to do and it's not necessarily sort of objectively, scientifically measuring whether somebody has stress. Imagine that you would have a watch that very accurately measures whether you are stressed. And then it says to you, you are stressed now, very stressed. I mean, does that help? Um, <laughs> maybe you just be even more stressed, right, because, uh, for hearing that. So, so maybe the whole point of this thing is not about whether it measures all right, but what it gives back, right? So, so one of the lessons also that came from this is to think much more about the feedback of those kinds of systems. Whereas most of the technologies are focused on the measurement, yeah, because they work together with scientists, so they want to know, they want to measure correctly, right? So that's, that's one um, example. example. Uh, second example in the home, we built a system of, uh, and it went through many uh, iterations uh, in different forms. It was one big lamp, and, and, at the, uh, and we used Philips Hue lights and so on. And, but at some point, it became these little lamps, so they are about this big. Um, and there, we've got seven now. And the idea would be that you have a lot of these lamps. They are wireless, and you can program them to go on when you want. So they are like reminders for yourself. And you can put them everywhere in your physical environment to give you a sort of, to highlight something that you want to be highlighted at that moment. So it's like a calendar, but the sort of the reframing is, is that it's not a message that's on your screen telling you, you need now to do the dishes. It's just the light goes on in the kitchen at the moment that you intended to do the dishes, you planned that, but you're doing something quite different. Right, so you're uh, totally absorbed in something else. Then the light in the corner of your eyes, the light goes on. You look and you see the dishes, and you know that you ha wanted to do the dishes. You're, right? the, the lamp doesn't have to tell you uh, do the dishes now, um, but it's just it's drawing you to the place where you have planned your task. Right? Now the idea of uh, this uh, uh, product is even more um, ambitious, <laughs> and I don't know if that works at all, but. Um, the conceptual idea of it would be that at some point this would also help you to physically reorganize your space, right? At some point you may you may have in, uh, maybe you have four different kinds of administration tasks, and you invented four lamps for that, and these administration tasks are at four very different places in your apartment, and then maybe at some point you think, well, what if I put all the administration in one place? and then put one administration lamp there. So this would be the kinds of things that you would rationally assume that everybody would do anyway, right? So organize your room, right? You, you want to organize your room. But two things. One of it is I don't want to get told by somebody else how to organize my room. So in this way, I might sort of find out for myself what works and what doesn't. And secondly, maybe I want to organize it in a very different way and on the basis of very different categories then people from the outside would find rational or logical, right? So, uh, for instance, Max, I told you about Max, he has a cupboard, and in the cupboard are what I would call maybe 12 different categories of things. I would never put all of those 12 things in one cupboard. I would actually put them in 12 different cupboards or different places, like uh, very personal things and uh, tickets from the train and so uh, everything. But it's very, uh, we talked a lot about this cupboard, and I, I still don't understand what this cupboard does, but it's very important for him. And uh, he's assured me this cupboard needs to be like this, right? So who am I to then say, well, that's not handy, Max. Let's, uh, let's, let's organize it the right way. Huh? So, so this sort of normative, uh, kind of uh, external normative uh, idea of telling people 
how they should live their lives. That's what this um, project is responding to. Even if that, the actual functioning of these seven little lamps is probably not <laughs> going to do that much, but it raised all that kind of discussion in the, in the, that we had with the caretakers, parents, and, and, and uh, autistic people themselves. Also, oh yeah, and one final thing about this thing is that in the beginning it was a planner. So the care organization that we work with, they, uh, they really wanted people in their uh, assisted living apartments to use a calendar. And they didn't. Or at least this one person didn't. Um, uh, so that was the start of the project. But uh, after a while, we started to make not a planner, but a reflector. So it's still a, a temporal thing. There's also a graphical interface with it. It looks like a calendar. In some sense, it is a calendar, but the whole functioning of it is that you just you you can you can just grab these lamps on the fly and put them where you want them, and then um, they they send the message back to your calendar and they pop up in your calendar and then you can start to plan them. So you you make plans on the basis of what you're already doing. So it's a reflection on your actions, which is a very different process from having to think everything uh, from beforehand. This is a, at some point we tested this with uh, uh, three different people that each used the thing for a week and they su made suggestions for how to change it and the lighting or at some point in the end we added also sound, somebody wanted sound. And then uh, one of our students immediately built it and then we tested it again uh, on the next round. So we did a sort of design through and but also using it, really using it at the same time. And a sort of a related spin-off idea is this one, which is uh, really about if you stumble upon a certain uh, activity in your home that you think you should be doing. So this is all about planning and organization, right? So if you stumble about something that you think you should be doing, but uh, you don't want to do it at that moment because you're, had a, you're engaged with something else, then you can put a physical wooden tag onto it. And on the central display, uh, a light will slowly go on and then over time uh, it w the light will go stronger and stronger and at the end it will even make a sound saying to you, like you put a task, you snooze this task, you sort of put it away uh, and you still haven't done it and then so you have actually have to go and physically get to the place where the laundry is or whatever and then get that tag, um, hopefully do the task, probably the thing doesn't do the task for you. And then you go back and then you put it in the, in the device again and then, uh, then it finishes. So this we're going to test out now. Uh, that's the newest thing. And then finally, this is all brand new. So because uh, like just yesterday I got a movie from a student who uh, uh, was making a concept out of this. So this is out on the street. Um, it actually came from a chat with Damien Milton. Um, so we, we were talking about, and, and we were talking about sound, and we were talking about the public space, and about uh, stressful and uh, situations and, and uh, stimuli on the street that, that might raise tension or induce anxiety. So what we did was we, um, um, and, and we also we did a sort of a very small Twitter survey, uh, finding out a lot about how people use music and sound to navigate public spaces. So a lot of people wear headphones with their favorite music or even just with uh, white noise uh, to sort of block out everything else and just be able to go through everything. Um, and so I want to show a little movie about the concept uh, that, uh, that we're now just starting to work on. All right, so, so that's, um, that's an idea, a first idea about how interactivity which is uh, sort of mixing the physical and the digital world can help you sort of um, strengthen the space, the physical space, strengthen it in a way that it becomes more your space, your own life world, right? Um, and of course, once you have this basic system, you can do all kinds of things. You could do uh, sharing things, um, um, the, have the system track where you've been and how many times. And I don't know if that's useful, but all of that's possible, right? So there's a very rich uh, uh, arena of possibilities to, to, uh, to further develop that. And what we're now interested in is, of course, we just have this movie now to engage as many autistic people as possible and then to design the actual concept together with us based on the first idea. 
So reflections. So what is the design challenge about? So um, at the recent conference of Autistica, uh, Sue Fletcher Watson said, uh, well, many social skills are not really a thing. They're just some arbitrary cultural norms that we decided to call social skills, right? And I think that's a very important point to make uh, because uh, there's so much focus uh, on social skills, on behaving correctly in social situations. Um, and there's still a, a thread of that is very much um, uh, in the 1950s you had it in very much the same way trying to make uh, what we called asocial families um, um, uh, behave properly, right? And there would be a social worker coming to check in your home whether you, uh, with the mother, whether she had done the laundry and whether everything was all right and whether she was actually cooking fish on Friday and, and, and meat on Wednesday and, and all those, I mean in the Netherlands, that was, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is what my mother told me, but uh, <laughs> a bit younger than that. So we've passed that, but we see that with, with special groups, uh, some of that is still there, and it's quite normative, right? And, and the question is, should it be that normative, or is it more about um, can we make it in such a way that people, well, you don't want people to become cyber criminals, eh, as we just heard, and we don't want people to um, 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 right, lose their jobs. And so there's all kinds of things, or, and you, we want people to have jobs, so you need to adapt to the world. But we can also change the world a little bit so, and make an interface so that you can be yourself and the world can, can sort of interact with you. And as Damien Milton said about the double empathy problem, it's a, it's a bit of both, right? It's a, it's a, it's a two-way street that we, uh, and, and, and I think design can help uh, surface that, make that explicit by pro making proposals of new kinds of systems that don't install the, the, the norm that's already there, but instead uh, make that two-way street, for instance, very visible. Um, and so social skills was really not a topic in the work that we did. We talked with a lot of people, social skills were not the topic. So it was all about uh, hypersensitivity, uh, it was about getting into action and switching action and uh, or having a very strong focus or no focus on things. It was about anxiety and stress. It was about managing your everyday life, so just very practical things. Uh, it was about uh, not becoming totally um, burned out by having to adapt to the norm, <laughs> to the neurotypical structures in our environment, uh, and depression. So these were things that were very, and, and there's maybe many more, and you, you may know other themes, but I think it's already very important to list the themes that we actually want to design for and do research on that come out of the community uh, itself. Um, so what can be the role of technology then? Um, it, at the same Autistica conference, I think it was, I, I wasn't there, it's all, all from the social media. Um, help me to live life on my terms, it's what Lena Buckle said, and she made a whole list that's somewhere on Twitter still. Uh, and that, that, I, uh, that resonated mu with much of uh, um, how we look at things as well from our department. So um, I would say, I would try to design technologies that are not training skills uh, based on certain external normative frames, but to help a person develop the routines that they need that are meaningful to them in order to deal with their, their everyday world, right? So it can be about training skills, but it should be sort of a co-designed skill. Like what is actually the routine that you want to develop? What should it look like? And in the same way, not to organize, um, uh, not instruct people how to organize their lives, but, uh, or to say to them, oh, you did it right or you did it wrong, but um, to create a sort of feedback from what you do, from which you can make sense yourself, and then um, build further and support your own life world. So to make, make these, these mattresses kind of that help you. Um, so this is actually Max. This was the photo that I was allowed to show. He made the photo himself also. Uh, I, I made lots of photos, but he, he dismissed all of them. Um, uh, and um, I'm still in, uh, in touch with uh, Max, uh, so I, I visit him regularly. And um, at some point he said, uh, oh, so the caregiver was saying, oh, Max, now you have this nice lamp that the students designed for you. 
um, which is not true because it was co-designed. Uh, he was part of the whole project. Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing was, um, then she said, oh, now we can put the, um, the daily schedule, the daily schedule, we can put it in your lamp. And then Max said, oh, no, no, we're not going to put your schedule into my lamp. <laughs> and I like that very much. So I use that uh, quote a lot uh, because it says about um, um, have building your own life world is very empowering. And, and being engaged in such a design project is also very empowering. It's, it, it, it makes you have a, a very stronger voice on your own life. And like through this little conversation about this lamp, uh, they were actually sort of negotiating uh, who gets to say what about what, right? So, so, uh, but, but it wasn't a high level like, so who's actually in charge here? No, it was about whether that information got to go into that lamp. We had other conversation about whether the caretaker would be allowed to read the data from the lamp or not. So to read about what Max was doing with the lamps, whether that would be allowed or under what conditions it would be allowed and so on. And uh, I think around these technologies, you can have these um, uh, very interesting discussions. I, I'm, I don't know how I'm from time. Am I going? Oh, five minutes. Okay, so I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm always done. So um, the, the, the final reflection. Um, lately, I've come to, so in the beginning, when, in the way I was brought up as a design researcher, co-design was a process that led to a product. And then finally, at some point, of course, the product should become, come on the market, tested, uh, uh, rigorously tested, and then put on the market, and then it was just doing what it was doing, right? But more and more, I come to see that actually co-design as a process can be just part of everyday life. So you can... You can, and, and together with technological tools of today, people can uh, sort of be um, um, uh, designing their own environment. Um, so this, this goes more in the direction of, you have the maker spaces, the fab labs, there's all kinds of ways nowadays to program and build your own things. But even if you're not into that, it can also be about um, having systems that you can change a lot about, that you can personalize, and then when you buy that kind of system, it wouldn't already be completely functioning. It would be like a toolbox, and then together, maybe together with somebody else, with a caregiver or with a professional that, that is also trained for that, you could sort of find out, okay, how do I want my system to be? Do I want light or sound? What kind of uh, samples of feedback do I want to put in? Do I want to put in movies or pictures or whatever and, and so on, right? And there's already a lot of uh, apps that uh, give you the possibility of putting in your own content. And I think um, one of the questions is whether uh, healthcare professionals should be trained in the principles of co-design um, so that they can help uh, uh, people on the spectrum to, to, to go through this process and maybe go to it again when, when, when their life changes again huh? and they have to make new adaptations. So a bit of design thinking in the care system, so to speak. All right, so that's uh, basically it. And um, if you want to be involved in the TREX project or in any other project, uh, I'd be very much interested. Please just uh, uh, send a message. Uh, because um, at some point, uh, where, uh, when we have the time to continue this project, um, we would like to very quickly build a first application that could be downloaded and that people could just put on their phones with the headphones on and just try out. And then maybe we even have 100 people just trying it out on the streets and then giving feedback. And we could sort of mass, uh, massively co-design the, how the system should be changed and adapted. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Yola. Would you like to come and join me up on the, on the stage here? Sure. Um, well, I don't know about you, but I was just... Well, I can hardly speak to explain what I feel about that. I'm so passionate about thinking about things differently. Um, and uh, I think that's exactly uh, what I took away from your presentation, is that actually really good design is a chance to really revisit not just the immediate problem at hand, but the whole thinking behind it. So uh, I'd really, uh, really interested to know if anybody's got any questions. Oh, somebody at the back. Yeah. Sorry, it's a bit wordy. I've, so I've written it down. Do you know, do you know uh, Mark? It's Mark Brosnan before. Um, yeah, we, were, we sort of mentioned 
that autistic people uh, tend to have a greater digital affinity. Um, you know, a sense that the robot or the program has got like an operating system we can relate to. Um, and so given that there's a more, like a high percentage of people in Silicon Valley with uh, autism or you know, autistic traits compared to the general uh, population, and that these autistic people are building the, uh, the technologies that neurotypical people uh, were increasingly uh, dependent upon. So, uh, I mean, is the world uh, naturally uh, becoming more autism friendly anyway, like by itself? That's a very, um, a very good, yeah, um, um, that could very well be. Eh? I, I have, so there is, so there's an easy answer to it, which is that um, even though, well, supposing, that, but because I think it's also not completely true, right? So there's a trend and a tendency and there's, um, well, but, yeah. but supposing in the it's, that it's... In the sense that it inevitably will sort of, it's leading in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, you could say that, maybe, uh, but... I would say that there's a very, it's a much, in Silicon Valley and in engineering and technology, there's a much stronger force and that force is about money. So it's, ab it's about uh, how can we build systems that sort of drag out uh, data, it's now the new thing, from people so that we, we are sort of, um, uh, we're being uh, milked like cows, right, in a, in a big stable. And that's a very big, and, and the engineers in Silicon Valley are only cogs in that machine. That's, that would be my opinion. So actually they don't have that strong a voice in, in uh, determining the, the infrastructure that we are now sort of becoming much more fixed into. So that's, that would be my, but this is all, <laughs> this is certainly, we're way beyond anything evidence-based or science, this is just my <laughs> personal speculation. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to sort of... No, but just, just, just to follow up, like, no, I agree with that, but the, the sort of... Um, the, the, like, you, even though the sort of, they might be uh, the cogs, the, um, the things that the... Uh, the, the, the sort of mechanisms that the cogs uh, eventually sort of add up to and then end up creating are more sort of conducive uh, to autistic people. So they're, they're more able to, um, to, to, to function in that type of uh, system. As opposed to, yeah. Look, everyone, there's been a lot of people here tonight and just, oh, you know, like me, myself, I don't know anything about like coding or anything like that. And sort of the, um, the, this sort of uh, push or the need for me to understand it. It's quite daunting, you know. I don't know anything, anything about coding and so on. So I just think it's in the future, if everything is, is becoming more, uh, uh, technological, um, there is sort of like, oh, you know, we need to really, we need to get up our game here, and you know, otherwise we're just going to be, um, I don't know, disconnected ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And but you said it yourself. Eh? You're you're not into coding, and and what I found mostly about autistic people, as I've met them, is that everyone's so different, right? Um, so um, there is this cliche picture, but that's not representing autism right it's it's uh, um, well there's people very much into technological stuff then but the whole group as a whole is very heterogeneous heterogeneous is that the english yeah so so it and and um so in that sense i, I don't think you can generalize like that but uh, and then there's a second thing which is that technology is lots of things right so this is also technology, yeah? so, uh, so we, we can talk about interactive technology or digital technology and so on, but um, um, in general, what as designers, we're not necessarily interested in digital technology, that's just what's happening today, but uh, I see also a movement back to physical stuff and making things that, are, that have wireless connection but are also made of very nice oak wood for instance, at the same time. And that kind of, that's also coming back. And I think that's changing a little bit the world again in a different direction. Mm, I agree. Sorry, can I just, just, just at the end, yeah. just that I know what you're saying about the, 
it could be cliche that autistic people are into uh, you know one specific type of um, segment of, of technology, but in terms of, like like it gets you know more fundamental than that, just like uh, an affinity with like the systematic or the logical, the you know structure, um, uh, routine, the sort of concrete things like you, you know say, and I, that I, also I, you know. sorry. No, no, that's, that's basically. <laughs> I was just sure. going to say, I mean, I certainly, I think one of the most exciting point things from my perspective is that it, it's unlocking new opportunities for everyone, but these opportunities are potentially a lot more accessible for autistic people because previously the world was based predominantly on a physical way of being and interacting, and actually now digital enables a new way, other ways, different ways of working. That's certainly what sort of my sort of research and, uh, and activities have been around, is to, to try and understand how those can be beneficial, not just for autistic people, but for everyone. And, and I think you're absolutely right, that potentially as more people gain the skills, gain the confidence and to, to, to use technology, and you don't have to be a uh, you know, have coding skills. Trust me. I mean, most of my colleagues that work with me when I'm, we're doing digital things just try to keep me away from a lot of the technology because I tend to make it go wrong. I don't know, my magnetic energy or something. But I, I love it. I love its opportunity. I love the potential it creates. And actually, when you collaborate, when you find people who have different skills to you, different experiences, and, and you work together on things, then actually you, you can create this. We saw in some of these wonderful videos, this fantastic new energy around co-design, both within the community and across different uh, communities. I mean, personally, I like to think of us all as a bit just one big community, but somehow we kind of have been struggling how to communicate, and perhaps de digital has a role in that. Sorry, that was a very long <laughs> spiel. Um, any other questions? Uh, sorry, that lady in the middle there. Think to yes, um, thank you so much for your very interesting talk. Um, I would like to pivot off previous comments and questions in terms of um, because of the because of the constant exposure that um, we are constantly gaining on technological skills, technical skills, and how um, there seems to be a lot more focus on STEM subjects, whereas many other subjects don't seem to have as much attention from the public. And since we're moving into a more digital era, what would you suggest um, is the best way to include so, so many other diverse people from diverse backgrounds to still be able to join in the digital revolution, even if they didn't predominantly come from a technical STEM background? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so there's more and more people are trying to build toolkits or create uh, creative spaces where you could make things in fairly easy ways without having to have the coding skills. So for the pro some of the prototypes, so actually to, to give a bit of background, a lot of my students actually are not, uh, they, they're not very good coders at all. They, are, uh, they come from industrial design, which was traditionally physical, right? They, they, they design a bike or a, a bench on the street or things like that. Uh, or um, this cap. Uh, yeah. um, so, so they now need to do the same thing as well. They need to find ways of designing partly digital things without having the skills. So there's some toolkits for designers and I think you can extend them for the general public, right? Um, on the other hand, I also see how um, tools are merging more and more again with the physical and social world so it's not just actually so i'm not personally not a very big fan of being in the digital world all the time i, I find it very interesting how it's also coming back in the physical world and once it's there other disciplines become relevant immediately so if you want to design a smart object in the home you need you immediately need something like an anthropologist or a sociologist or a psychologist or a, 
um, I don't know, a furniture decorator or um, people that are not traditionally d doing digital stuff. Uh, because otherwise you, you will find out that your, your thing is not working because you put it into a context where all the, that other stuff is suddenly also taking part in it. And that's where I think it becomes really interesting. But the challenge, of course, is to bring all those voices together and then, of course, uh, uh, making PR for ourselves, we should say, well, that's what the designer is then <laughs> supposed to be doing, right? So to, to have all those people at the table and have them talk to each other. And there it is. Um, my daughter commissioned services for elderly care, and the things that you've shown us would certainly help keep older people independent and safe in their own homes that would support their families, and it would also help disabled people. But as a mum, I want my daughter to visit me when I'm an older person. I don't want a hologram, I want my daughter. So when you're designing these things, can you also include the younger people to remind them to contact mum, go and see <laughs> that, that helps keep me healthy. And it gives her a good conscience, which helps keep her healthy. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. So, so um, we would always look for those kinds of values first. Like, what is the value that you want to be uh, su that you want to support? And if you value face-to-face -face contact, then uh, then that's one of the things, the ingredients that should go into the mix of designing a solution. Uh, another one would be that uh, your daughter has a 40-hour work week and lives 300 miles away. That could be then another thing you throw in the mix. Then you have a problem, right? But that's interesting for designers because then you want to uh, service both these requirements and then find some kind of solution. And it will be something else than both you or your daughter thought on beforehand. Uh, but you have to find something outside of the box because Inside the box, there is no solution. Eh? Inside the box, those th two things don't go together. Um, and then, so I don't know what will come out. Uh, we, we had one uh, little concept uh, involving uh, children and elderly people where at least when an elderly person would come home, um, would t take off a necklace and then uh, go past all the uh, picture frames of the children. And then all those children, by going past the picture frames, would get a message saying uh, your mom uh, arrived safely at home um, or the thief that just stole the necklace. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not solving your problem right away. But also, I, I know how busy she is, the responsibility she's got. I don't want to be a nuisance, but I still want her. Yeah, so it's a dilemma, right? Yeah, that's good. That we like that as design. But um, I don't have a straightaway solution. But we could make a project out of it. Yeah. The final question. Uh, it's just to um, I'm just reflecting on some of the visual kind of sensory aspects of project design because I think for me that is a big thing that's very intrusive, and you know I would definitely want my environment to be adjustable to me in terms of temperature and light and sound. And definitely. I think there's a lot of just design that could make a difference in terms of colour and it could be calming that's more adult than some of the things we see aimed at children. They all talk about sensory experiences, but they could just be more adult and more part of our everyday architecture. Yeah, definitely. So but and you can go two ways, right? You could as an, the arch architects could design spaces in general differently than they used to do if they have much more knowledge about what these subtle things like lighting and color and patterns on the floor, <laughs> what they can do, right? Um, uh, so that's a general, but of course it's also interesting to look at if you can make uh, spaces adaptable um, or you give people the tools of adapting them themselves, then you could just create the patterns that you like uh, your own make your own stuff out of it. Yeah. And I'm very, very sorry. Oh, there's one more question at the back there. It's just a small point. I really liked your um, point about researchers uh, needing to find out what is the case. 
and designers um, thinking about what could be the case and actually that you know exciting new ways of thinking and the pro I've been completely inspired by your talk um, come out of putting those two together and maybe encouraging the researchers to relax a little and think about what could be the case although which of course they do do but you know but with that always with that you know needing to know that the evidence is good and before you can make recommendations about stuff and bringing that design thinking in and, and freeing people up to be able to think freely and let the ideas come. Um, and I guess the practicalities of putting people from different disciplines together and uh, is, is so much good can come out of that. Um, it'd be nice to hear your thoughts about how you do that on a regular basis. Well, the first part of what you said, I have nothing to add to. It's a <laughs> I totally agree. And how you bring all the people together, that's a difficult one because all the parties at the table uh, are, we call them stakeholders because they have stakes. So researchers have grant money and, and they have to write papers and in the papers there needs to be a table with statistics we got because otherwise it doesn't get published and uh, that's their interest. And then, and then all these other stakeholders have their own interests. So uh, the, m most of the effort goes into bringing together the group and, and talking a lot with people about and, and trying to find out when would this project be interesting for you. And then we try to do it like with, with smaller projects with, with students. If you have a movie like this, it's just a start, but then you can already start like, oh, can you see this movie? What do you think about it? So you already start to design little things and then use them as conversation starters. But then you have to find out, so when would this thing be interesting? What would we have to change about it? Or what angle would we have to look onto it for, for, you, for it to be interesting for you? And then, yeah, well, then hopefully they get on board and then, um, and then you need to have some funding and then <laughs> minor detail. And then you're off, off you go.